Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. A very warm welcome on this third Sunday of Advent. We begin our worship singing the hymn, Hark the Glad Sound. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and blessed, blessed be God's, God's kingdom, kingdom now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. We are gathered together as the family of God in our Father's presence to offer praise and thanksgiving, to ask forgiveness of our sins, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek God's grace, that through Jesus Christ our Lord and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we, we may, may give, give ourselves, ourselves to God's service. Return to the Lord, who will have mercy. To, to our, our God, God, who will richly pardon. O Lord God of hosts, restore us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Show us the light of your countenance and we shall be saved. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. O Lord, show us your mercy and grant us your salvation. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God, who, who sent, sent his Son into, into the world to save sinners, bring us pardon and peace now, now and, and forever. forever. Amen. Let us pray. Stir up our prayers, Lord, and hear us, that they who are sorrowful and suffering may rejoice at the advent of your only begotten Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Paul's letter to the Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to Christ our, our Saviour. Saviour. 
John said to the crowds coming out to be baptised by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to tell you, to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe has been laid to the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? the crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptise you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. Give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel. Praise, Praise to, to Christ, Christ our, our Lord. Lord. The phrase that really stood out for me in this um, reading, the gospel reading, um, was, what then should I do? And again, people ask what should we do teacher what should we do and I have to admit to feeling a bit sorry for this crowd of folk who come out to be baptized by John aren't they ideal converts they're not only coming to him for baptism but they keep asking him what they should do but John's response is pretty fierce you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath all of us will have experienced at some point, I should think, the type of preaching that doesn't sound like good news, but rather that we are being berated. And many of us will know too of people who have been put off church and, and even faith because they've gone to church and come out feeling bad about themselves. So I hope I would never feel tempted to say, you brood of vipers to anyone. But the amazing thing is that the crowds did flock to, to John. They knew that behind those words, they were, this was good news, that there, were, there was good news to hear from him, good news that would make a difference to their lives, good news that would set them free from all that had gone before and from all that had separated them from God. John came to the people preaching the need to repent, but there was also a promise, a promise of hope, a promise that one would come after him who would baptise them with the Holy Spirit and with fire, with power, Jesus, the righteous judge. And we too can be confident that when we come to Jesus in repentance, trusting his power to save us, asking him, what should I do? He will bring his power to bear in our lives, enabling us to bear fruit, fruit that lasts. And note too that the repentance um, asked by those who, who come to John is actually quite simple. As they ask, what should we do? John responds to each different group in a way that meets their needs exactly where they are. He doesn't demand huge or impossible or strange things from them, but simply from the tax collectors that they shouldn't collect more than they should, from the soldiers that they shouldn't use their position to make more money for themselves, and to the people in general, the one who has clothes should share, and the one who has food should share. It is in these things, John says, that the fruits of their repentance will be evident. What a simple gospel that is. Do the things you know you should do, 
and you will be blessed. And I find that good news indeed. The God who calls us to repentance through the words of his prophet and through his son deals with us gently and kindly. The fruit we are asked to bear is manageable for us. It's very easy for us because of how we construct God in our minds to imagine that God, if we ask him, what should I do, calls us to make great sacrifices or change our lives altogether. But just as John, speaking on God's behalf, knew what each of those folk needed to hear, God who made us and knows us inside out, knows what we need to hear in order to bear fruit. And he will let us know, if we ask him, what should I do? So God deals with us gently and kindly. That's the first bit of good news. And secondly, when we do ask him, what should I do and listen, the Holy Spirit will come upon us with power and enable us to stop doing those things we shouldn't and start doing the things that we should. We may expect huge things of ourselves and set ourselves up to fail, but God doesn't. God looks at our heart. If we keep asking him, what should I do? He will not let us fail but rather show us, teach us, through his Holy Spirit, how we need to change in order to bear the fruit that lasts. So in the words of Paul, rejoice indeed, and don't be anxious about anything. Trust in the one who saves, and his peace will guard your heart, even as you are changed from the inside out. Over to me. I don't think I'm going to contradict you. <laughs> um, so my my thought on these readings. Um, I found the, the reading from Philippians and from Luke in some ways strange companions. Because in Philippians we, we find an, exhorta an exhortation for us to, for us as followers of Christ, to rejoice. To live life with joy being one of our central characteristics. Whereas in Luke, we find John the Baptist fulfilling his calling, which is to call the people to repentance, to exhort people to live just and holy lives, to demonstrate that they are God's people rather than just relying on their birthright. That's why John the Baptist says, don't start saying that Abraham is my ancestor. Nonsense. Anyway. Instead, show us, show the God that you follow. So on one hand, we're meant to be joyful, and on the other hand, we have the hard work of salvation, as Sarah's just said, it's easy, <laughs> or manageable at least. But I suppose, man yes, it's manageable, but it is still hard work, I think. Uh, avoiding temptations, putting others first, and truly demonstrating the love of God in all that we say and do. So how do we reconcile these things? Well, let's start with John the Baptist. His context was seen last week. He is a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight paths for the Lord. And that's what he's doing. He's doing it in a style very similar to the Old Testament prophets. He's often thought of as the last of the Old Testament prophets, although he is in the New Testament. So there you go. Uh, anyway, he warns the people then to turn from their sins and live. They need to live. And God can make them live, because God is the judge and ruler of the whole earth. And not everyone will enter into his kingdom. Some will be saved and will enter it, and others will not. I know I am sometimes guilty of only sharing the good news without sharing the context of the bad news first. Here's my chance. <laughs> anyway, the world is broken. The world was and is broken by sin. And who is it that has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God that we were made to demonstrate, made in and as the image of God? Well, that would be all of us, from the first to the last. All of humanity has contributed to the brokenness of the world. And you don't need me to go over again uh, the sort of sins that 
that lead to climate change, or the sins of violence and hatred, of unforgiveness, of greed, jealousy and injustice, the things that we see in the news and also experience in our own lives. We all have eyes to see that this is how the world is. And we all have minds and consciences that say this is not the way the world is, is meant to be. And so folk come out to the wilderness to hear John, and straight-talking John tells them exactly how it is. You need to turn to God, because the day is coming when you will be judged, and the axe is ready. Are you producing good fruit? Because if not, the tree will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So these folk from different backgrounds ask him questions. What must I do, as Sarah saying. And I too, like Sarah, am struck by the simplicity of his answers. The crowd asks, what must we do? And John the Baptist replies, be kind, share your excess food and clothes with those who have none. Tax collectors ask, what must we do? John replies, well, you can be a tax collector, but you need to be a kind one, no stealing. Soldiers ask, what must we do? Well, be soldiers, but don't be bullies. You're paid enough as it is. And I think the strange thing is that, of course, these people knew all this already. It reminds me very much of the prophet Micah. The whole nation of Israel is um, recorded as asking him the same question. What should we do? And he sort of winds them up a bit by listing complicated and expensive things that God might require of them. And then says, no, it's none of these things. And uh, I unfortunately memorised this by music that I, I learned once, so I might have to sing to you, I'm sorry. It said, what Micah says in reply is, God has shown you, O people, what is good. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God? Do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. I found it too catchy to forget. So God has already shown us the sorts of things that we should do. And it is simply that. And yet we do not. And even when we are told, we won't always be able to achieve those simple things that we know that God calls us to. And then I think John the Baptist gets on to the good news. He says, I'm telling you these simple things that you need to do, but I'm not the Messiah. The one that God is going to send and send to save you from, from his judgment and the brokenness of the world is one who will do more than simply teach and call you to repentance, though he will do that as well. He will as well immerse you in the Holy Spirit and fill you with fire to burn out all this evil that is in us and leave only what is good. What we cannot do for ourselves, just follow simple rules. Jesus will do for us. And if we turn to Jesus, then we will not only know what is good, but be ever more empowered to actually live it out and somehow be sure of our salvation, our being plucked from the broken world that is heading for the axe. For God will make all things new, but whatever and whoever chooses brokenness will be gone. And that is the source of Paul's joy in Philippians. No longer do we depend on our birth or on our effort or on our circumstances to dictate to us whether we are saved from the coming judgment. But we rely instead on Jesus, the one who came that we may bear fruit and live. And bear fruit that will survive the fire and last for eternity. When Paul writes this, he's not being glib about joy. He's writing from prison, after all. His worldly circumstances would apparently give him no hope. 
but his joy constantly rests in the salvation that Jesus has wrought for us and bought us through his coming at Christmas, through Jesus' life and teaching, through his death and resurrection. To him be glory forever. Let this mind be in you, which it was, was in Christ, Christ Jesus. Jesus. The, divine the divine nature was his from the first, yet, yet he did not grasp, grasp at equality, equality with God. God. He, he emptied himself and became like a slave. slave. Taking the nature of man, he was revealed in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient even to death, death on a cross. Therefore God has raised him on high and has given, given him a name above every other name. name. So, so that, that in the, in the name, name of Jesus, Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven, heaven on earth, and, and in the depths, and every tongue confess that Jesus, Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God, God the Father. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Holy Lord God, thank you for John preparing the way of the Lord. Help us to hear your call for us to, to change our lives, to, to do the things we know are good. And we thank you that you are able to help us with this, that we do not do it on our own. And when we fall, you lift us up all the way to your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for your world, that your world would, would know truly what state it is in and turn to you. We pray, Father, for the brokenness of the world that we see in, in the way the, the weather works and natural disasters. We pray that you would help those who are suffering tornadoes in America, volcanoes in Indonesia, and all those suffering that, that we do not know about. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for your world dealing with uh, the threat of the coronavirus and this new um, variant, the Omicron um, variant. Pray that you'd help us to be wise again, once more considering uh, putting more restrictions in place, whether and help us all to be wise in what we choose to do and not to do, that we may love our neighbour in our choices. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. We pray for your, for your church. Pray that your church would proclaim your good news Proclaim your judgment that sets us free. We'd be able to use the right words to, to call people to repentance and show them the way to everlasting life. So we pray for all your people, all the clergy and the, for the bishop of this diocese, for Bishop John. We pray for others in, in ministry, for, for Tim Tunley and the mission to seafarers. We pray that at this Advent and Christmas time, your love would be shone clearly from each and every person in your church. Lord, in your mercy, we are yeah. our Father, you, you call us to, to rejoice and you also give us peace that passes understanding. So we pray that in, in the darkness that some folk find themselves, you would somehow still show them joy, that that peace would, would come in and flood, flood their lives, baptising them in your peace. So we pray for all who are struggling or suffering at this time, from loneliness or sickness, 
from from loss. We pray also for those who have recently died that they would know that peace in in an eternal way. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. Lord God, we ask all these prayers in Jesus' holy name, knowing that you hear them and answer them quickly. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our, our Father, Father in, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your, your kingdom come. come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Do not bring us to the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We meet in Christ's name. Let us share his peace. My soul waits for the Lord, in his word is my hope. My soul waits for the Lord, in his word is my hope. O Israel, wait for the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy. In his word is my hope. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. My soul waits for the Lord, in his word is my hope. Almighty God, we, we thank, thank you for, for the gift of, of your holy, holy word. May it be a lantern to our feet, a light upon our paths and a strength to our lives. Take us and use us to love and serve all people in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our next hymn is A Great and Mighty Wonder.
The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Christ, the Son of Righteousness, shine upon you and scatter the darkness from before your path. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is To God Be the Glory. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you again. Bye. Bye for now. Bye.